Thank you so much. I'm uh, thrilled to be here in Auckland at the Art Gallery and uh, first time in New Zealand. Um, I'm very thankful to Rana Davenport and Zara Stanhope for having me here and to uh, Charlotte Swansbrook and Grizel Baker from the Contemporary Benefactors. I'm also very grateful to the team here at the Auckland Art Gallery that installed Cylinder 2, which is a uh, fairly challenging artwork to install. So it, it looks beautiful and uh, I've missed it and very happy to see it here today in the gallery. So I'll start with the introduction to kind of where, how I got to where I am. Um, I, I studied sculpture way back when at Yale University. Um, I started out making installations with light and, and, and environments and uh, medical equipment and all sorts of things, found objects that I would create these environments for. I, uh, you know, just after I finished at Yale, I, I became aware of, of, of the work of James Terrell and of Dan Flavin, and I realized that art could be, you know, much more stripped down to what I had been working with up to that time. Um, here's some work of, uh, of Dan Flavin out in, uh, in Marfa, Texas. Um, I actually grew up in El Paso, Texas, and in Juarez, Mexico, right on the border, and my, my mother's family is from Marfa. I've been ranching there for uh, over 100 years. Uh, so it was very exciting for me to, to realize that Donald Judd had come to Marfa and had uh, started, you know, created his own museum, making his minimal work and inviting his friends to, to make work um, out in the desert in the landscape. Um, I had the opportunity to go out and visit James Terrell at Roden Crater. Uh, Terrell purchased uh, thousands of acres of land in Arizona near Flagstaff and started shaping it into a uh, monumental uh, light sculpture. Uh, these are a couple of pictures I shot of these, these tunnels, um, apertures, uh, that it really remind me of a you know, when you describe like an after, after death experience. Um, and finally, when you arrive at the end of this tunnel, which you think is a, a circle, it turns out to be an oval. Um, there's many plays with space, um, different apertures and, and, and layers at, at Road and Crater. Um, and finally, when you get to the top, uh, or actually down in the bowl of the crater, there are these chairs in which you can lay back and recline. And, and, and one of Terrell's goals is to create this vaulting of heaven where he's bringing the sky down. So it was pretty wonderful to be able to experience it, you know, there and, and to, to, to be with, with James. Um, after uh, sort of those early experiences, I decided to, I was very intrigued by technology, so I ended up at NYU in the Interactive Telecommunications Program. And at that time, the, there was a big buzz about interactive television. So I was interested in taking television signals and remixing them and making sort of abstract art from all this, these sort of found images. The other thing I was doing is working at the medical center, um, making laparoscopic surgery simulators because it was the only way to get access to the silicon graphics computers that you needed to make virtual reality, which, which intrigued me. Uh, after NYU, I ended up going out to uh, do a summer internship at a, at a research lab in Palo Alto called Interval Research. And Paul Allen, who was one of the founders of Microsoft, had found, founded this research lab. Uh, this gentleman is named Michael Neymark, who is an amazing artist uh, from, he had studied at MIT, and his obsession is in capturing place. So he created the stereoscopic camera system on a uh, kind of a high-tech uh, stroller, and he would uh, push this thing around, and on the wheel there was an encoder, and at every, you know, a certain interval it would snap a stereoscopic pair of images. So we spent uh, the summer working with Michael, and this is some images he shot up in Banff, Canada on these trails. So this is a series of stills, and then from those stills we generated this, these in-between frames that the camera had never seen. So we were taking the data and dimensionalizing it and looking at it from, from points of view that, that the camera had never seen, which is very, you know, pretty exciting. The other uh, great thing that happened to me in the uh, summer of 94 is I went out to the Black Rock Desert to the Burning Man Festival, which is a, a pretty remarkable event. Um, in the early days, it started out very small. When I first went, maybe about a thousand people gathering in the Black Rock Desert, which is north of Reno, Nevada, and it's hundreds of square miles of parched earth with nothing growing, completely flat. Um, and people gather, and uh, this is a more recent image. Um, the, the population of Burning Man has, has grown to about 68,000 people to this point. Um, but it's a, uh, it's a city, it's a leave no trace event, everyone brings, you have to bring everything, your food, water, shelter for a week in a very harsh environment. 
but it's a fully functioning city. Uh, one of my main challenges in the early days of Burning Man was, was getting lost. Uh, there were no landmarks, there were no streets, and uh, it's a very disorienting environment. So I decided to do something about that, and I created this sculpture using 16 strobe lights and a simple microcontroller to be able to switch the lights off and on. So I took this and I mounted it on top of my mobile home um, and uh, as sort of a wayfinding device. And it was a, uh, you know, I programmed it, you know, in, at NYU in the physical computing lab. And, uh, and I went down to the lowest level of code. Zero was off and one is on. And I had 16 zeros and ones to play with. And I started sequencing the light. And what I realized was that I took it out into the, to this environment and it read, you could see this thing from a mile or two miles away, so it really had an ability to, to, be, to be visible. Um, it was out in the landscape and it was uh, using software. So I, I, I stumbled upon this piece and I brought it back to my studio in New York and I put an acrylic box over it. But I realized that there was tremendous power in uh, small amounts of information. And you didn't need, you know, beforehand, before then I had been working with virtual reality technology and it was sort of an arms race. You just needed more, more pixels and more, te more technology and if you had the supercomputer. But I, I stepped away from all that and realized I could go really low resolution and make very powerful work. Um, the other part was to, to take software and to make it, make it visible in an impactful way by using light. So this is a, a few years later. I, 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 I started showing my work in New York. I was in group shows, um, had a solo show, and, and I, but I had always wanted to work with large scale environments. This is out of PS1, um, which is part of MoMA and it's uh, in Long Island City. This is the side of the building during a construction project and I was offered an opportunity to create a very large piece. So um, here's my studio. Uh, we, we, I worked with a lot of engineers and we designed our own circuit boards, our own systems at this point you couldn't you couldn't buy this stuff so we had to make it so we custom inject injection molded cases we designed these uh, little led nodes uh, with custom programming um, this is our kind of embarrassing uh, control system that we had shoved in a box and i'm sure it would horrify any electrical inspector um, but in the end um, this is what it looked like, and it, it made this, uh, this piece that was 45 feet tall and 120 feet wide in a, kind of a barren wasteland sort of place. Um, but what, what I found was that there's a, there's a gas station right in front of the piece, and um, even the gas station attendant would notice when a, a very subtle sequence changed. And I, I realized that all sorts of people were looking at this and responding to it, uh, taxi drivers and whoever, um, so that you really could alter space with, with public art and affect a lot of people. Um, so the, 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 the important thing for me was that the piece, pieces are abstract. There are no images, there's no text in my work, it's all dealing with rules. And in this case, I was very inspired by the urban environment, the trains moving around, the elevated trains, you know, helicopters, um, sort of a, a, the movement of traffic, any sort of kinetic activity became part of the inspiration for the sequencing of these pieces. That piece uh, led to my next installation up at the Albright Knox in Buffalo. Uh, this was a Gordon Bunshaft building from, uh, from the 60s. Um, and uh, you know, it was much more exciting than working with a construction scaffold. This is a real piece of architecture. And uh, it's facing a neoclassical building, which you can sort of see reflected in the building. So that's 100 years old. This building was about 50 years old. And I was adding another very contemporary layer on top of that but all the LEDs were hidden behind this black glass. So the mechanism really disappeared and you were left just with the sequences of light. But it had the power to really change the way people see the building and to have these independent, these three independent languages, but all communicating in a, in a respectful way. And my goal was to add something to the building and not to just use it as a pedestal to put something on, really deeply integrating uh, my work into it. Um, and it, it turned out that it had, um, you know, people, people now come and, and there's a parking lot nearby. They, they pull up and sit and watch the lights at night. And it's really just changed the way that people see the building. And it somehow um, is evocative. Uh, and again, you know, just very minimal. Um, and my early interest was in, in, you know, a mathematician named John Conway's Game of Life, which is sort of a, you know, screensaver cliche. 
but if you if you look it up, you'll see that it's a uh, you know very simple set of rules. It governs a set of points. It can either be off or on. And from these very simple rules, these co very complicated patterns emerge that you would swear you're looking at a biological system or something under a microscope um, that was alive. Um, this is a couple years later at the Nerman Museum. Uh, Q Sung Woo was the architect of this building, and he very generously offered me this opportunity to build something into the entryway of the building. This is built into the soffit. Um, this is many more uh, lights. Um, and uh, simultaneously, my custom software was evolving, so I had to come up with new ways of sequencing these lights. I started working more with physics, with Newton's laws of acceleration, velocity, using mass, and starting to, um, you know, it, it, in, in, in my process, I have to sit in front of these pieces uh, with my laptop and make discoveries. So I would sit out um, night after night in front of the building and try things out and wait for that 1% of the time that something compelling would happen. Um, so I'm interested in the idea of emergent behavior. We don't necessarily know what's going to happen, but you create the circumstances or certain parameters and then let it sort of flow. Um, so when something compelling happens, I, I capture that moment. And then there's another process of further refining it, where it's, it's, it's very painterly, adding light, subtracting light, taking it away to the point that you're sort of really making compositions and then those compositions are presented in a random order and for a random amount of time. So there's no beginning or middle or end in my pieces, and it's like a shuffle scheme, but it's something that's, uh, that makes the pieces very livable. You don't feel like you've seen it, and then it's repeating again. You've seen this before. And, and there's a real sense of mystery to, to the pieces. This piece in particular is, is, is part of a, a campus, so there's students there, which is wonderful, and they come and lie you know, below the piece at night. Um, it's also visible from some very major boulevards, which are right nearby. So it, um, it engages it, and it brings the building to life in a way that, you know, without it would feel very kind of cold and, and somehow empty. But there's a, you know, real, these moments of, of you know, small, I, I, see, so I see these pieces sometimes as almost like creation myths where they start very simply, um, but then these, uh, whatever they are, these pixels start to multiply and grow and you know there are different layers as well there's sometimes these background layers foreground layers um, but it's, it's all about being very active and, and very much alive this is at the Brooklyn Academy of Music and uh, this was a, an amazing opportunity to work with a, a, a beautiful historic building um, and this was in 2007 and this started out being a, a project that was going to last a few months and we put the pieces up and um, just sort of left them there because they look great and everyone was very happy with them and, and eventually the, the BAM acquired the piece and it's there now permanently in New York. So these are 12 foot diameter circles with, with uh, LED lights which are similar to the cylinder piece that's here, very small lights. And uh, what was interesting to me in this context was that this is the Brooklyn Academy of Music. I don't, I don't really use any sound in my pieces but I would say that there's a very, um, I've been in several shows that explore the idea of synesthesia and remapping the senses. Um, and my compositional methods are very similar to what someone might use to create sound, except I'm, I'm making light sequences. Um, and I, I tried various things with these circles. At times I had them all synchronized together, which was kind of overwhelming. Other times I had them doing all different things, but then I came upon a way of, of having them do something that was connected. You could make a visual connection between them, but there were slight differences in the sequencing of each one. Maybe differences in tempo, one was ahead of the other. So it felt like music, and it felt like there were various voices, um, and it felt harmonious. So it was an exciting opportunity to kind of explore these uh, you know, connection to sound. This is a detail of it, kind of close up. So this is the, the kind of next piece I did in 2008 at the uh, National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. This is a tunnel that connects the east and west buildings. It was designed by I.M. Pei and uh, always felt a little, little dark and somewhat unresolved, even according to people in Pei's office. Um, so it was, uh, I was asked by Molly Donovan, a curator at the National Gallery, to think about what could be done in this space. So I spent a few months thinking about it and created a simulation. 
um, and showed it to some of the people at the gallery and they got very excited and we put up some, you know, some one fiftieth of the lights, I think about 800 lights and they saw it and decided to, to go ahead and, and, to, and to commission this piece that was supposed to be up for one year. Um, so it was, uh, but again, you know, the National Gallery in Washington is, a, is on the mall. It's a very conservative institution, very classic art, great art, but they don't really work with light and technology and this was something very, very new for them. And there was a lot of concern. I mean, some of their curators asked, you know, are people gonna have seizures with 41,000 lights? And um, I had to, you know, sort of convince them and, and, and to trust me that no, they were not. And this was a very different way of using light. Um, but the ceiling is low and it is a lot of light. So there's a lot of power. And uh, my, what was exciting is that people are already sort of going on this journey on these moving walkways. Um, so to augment that, and it kind of connected me back to some of the virtual reality interests that I had had way back when. So you're immersed in this light, you're surrounded by it. Um, and then the, the metal slats was part of Pei's architecture and they add another layer to what's happening, the reflections. So I knew that it was already an optically potent space and then the addition of 41,000 lights, all individually controllable and 255 levels of brightness per light gave me a lot of power to do um, all sorts of things. And, and I sat there, you know, for months programming this piece, fine-tuning it, you know, after the museum was closed in order to make these discoveries. Um, and there's a big fountain at the end of the piece, so, so there's a, a watery aspect to it. Um, there are elements of, of, of things moving back and forth as people are. Um, the shadow layers became very important. Taking light away uh, was critical. Um, but after, after a year of having been there, the, um, they, the National Gallery decided to keep this piece permanently because they really fall in love with it. And, and, and when this piece is off, it feels like someone turned the music off. And it feels like something's missing or something's wrong. And it feels very sad and, and sort of dead. So it was exciting to me how, um, you know, through algorithms and software, you could find, find life and things that you could swear were from nature or living. And, and finding that connection, I think, was something very powerful and something that I've been, I've been working on uh, for a long time. It's a different kind of piece. Uh, I, I don't just work in, in black and white. I, I make several color pieces. This is also in Washington, D.C., in a lobby. And this, this piece is, is, also, is, is also 200 feet long, um, but it's a milky glass uh, that's diffusing um, colored LED lights. And um, this piece is much more atmospheric, so it's really dealing with, it has a softness to it, almost felt like clouds or sunsets or different uh, kind of atmospheric effects. But again, you know, bringing this uh, very large lobby that was sort of, you know, sort of maybe uncomfortable to walk that distance through, really making something more out of it, and really activating the building in a unique way. You can see these transitions are, are very, very slow. You're not even aware at times of the transitions. They're, you know, they go maybe 15 to 20 seconds as they cross fade from one to the next. This is a uh, more recent project up at uh, Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. This is another building of Ian Pays um, from the 70s. This is the Johnson Museum, which I, I, I personally love this building. I think it's, it's amazing. Um, it's, it's kind of a very radical building because it's, it's Ithaca, there are a lot of hills, and this is way up on the hill. And it's, it's, it's part of an Ivy League campus, so it's very traditional architecture. But then you have this, this building, and I was asked to think about what we could do to, you know, what, where could a piece go on this building? So we decided to put it over the sculpture court. Um, and again, this is a architectural, you know, it's, it's a significant building, landmarked. We had to be very careful about not perforating the building and being very respectful of it. Um, so we spent a lot of time trying to match the, the, you know, the frame that we made to put the LEDs in. We powder coated it the exact color of the building. Um, and I spent a lot of time hiking around Ithaca. There are gorges and waterfalls and all sorts of activity happening there. It's also the place where Carl Sagan had studied. Um, so the piece ended up being called Cosmos because um, it had a kind of celestial aspect to it. 
but also a, kind of a watery, um, something about water, uh, these, these, these negative spaces that take light away also became very important. And here you can see how it's, it's sort of connected to, to the main part of the, of the campus. And it's right next to the art school and the engineering school and, and where all the, you know, the, the computer programming department is. So it was exciting for me to be in an academic environment where students could see these various disciplines really blended in a, in a new hybrid form. And it's completely altered the way people see, see the building. And uh, people really didn't even look at it before. It just became part of the environment. But this, this alters the way people see it. Um, and now you have people going down there and, and having picnics in front of it and um, doing all sorts of things that they, they, they certainly never did before. This is the uh, piece called Hive, which is the first digital artwork that the Metropolitan Transportation Authority in New York has commissioned. And it's uh, on Bleecker and Lafayette Street and, and right near Houston in, in New York. So it's a very central station. And it's nice because it's right near the tracks. It's right near the subway. And it was, it was exciting to work there and to create this honeycomb pattern, which had um, you know, these different granularities. You see light forms tracing through the matrix, this hexagonal matrix, which uh, mimics the, the trains moving through the system. Other times there are patterns in which individual hexagons are activated or big groups of hexagons. But there are multiple layers, multiple granularities of activity, but again, this you know, making this abstract map that floats overhead was uh, something that it, it seemed to work really well inside the, in the transit system. And it's also there's multiple level levels that go down. It's three three stories high, so there are many ways of experiencing it. On this escalator, you see little pieces of it, and as you move up, it, it's revealed. Um, but it you know again an, an opportunity to make public art and put something in, in places that, that art wouldn't normally go. And here's the, uh, the cylinder, uh, which uh, I'm really excited to have here uh, in person. I, I, I hesitate a lot of times to even document my work because I really like the idea of being present with it, to see, see it with your own eyes and to really encounter it. And this is a very poor, um, you know, even I, I try to find the best photographers and people I can work with, but it still doesn't compare to the actual experience of being present with these pieces. So I highly encourage you all to go and spend some time with the cylinder. Um, it's uh, almost 20,000 white LED lights uh, in mirrored stainless steel rods, and they're hanging, it's about 12 feet tall, hanging in concentric circles. And for me, my work is, you know, up, up, up until recently been kind of two-dimensional. It's been a rectangle, um, you know, about X and Y, but lately it's about adding Z, the Z axis. Um, so this is dimensional, volumetric, um, I, I love the way the piece hangs and it doesn't actually touch the floor, it just floats over it and the shadows that it makes. Um, and you have the light itself, but then you have this reflective material that's doing all these unexpected optical things, reflecting the light and creating this sort of feedback mechanism. And when you look up, there's that, um, you know, the, the entire top of the piece is, is mirrored, as you can see here. So it, it, there's, this, again, this sort of infinite quality to the, to the pieces. And I think, you know, one of, the, one of my early inspirations was Marcel Duchamp and his creation of these optical machines and roto-reliefs. And that's something I thought a lot about way back when. So in a way, this is, you know, is, is, it is an optical machine. Um, and I do believe that it's, uh, you know, the goal of these pieces is to, is to be able to transport you and take you somewhere. Um, but it's not one of these kind of lonely virtual reality experiments you know, experiences where you have a mask on and you're kind of separated from people. It's really, you're, you're all connected and everyone in the gallery is having an experience together. Um, but it's also, in a way, kind of a loose experience. It's not didactic, it's open-ended, it's abstract. You can make of it what you want. Um, and, it, you know, it's, it's highly subjective. So it's, um, all those things blended together, I think, make for, for pretty potent uh, work and and work that also has the ability to, uh, you know, I think there's, there's a lot to explore in this area. So uh, that brings me to uh, the project out in San Francisco, the Bay Lights. 
Um, this is a simulation of, of the Bay Lights. I was asked to think about the bridge and if I could use the bridge as my canvas, what would I do? And I spent a few months thinking about it and working on a model, uh, making an actual 3D model and then I made this in, in After Effects and with Photoshop and showing it to people at, at Caltrans, the organization that runs the bridge. And we started to get some people very excited about what, you know, what a piece like this could be. And uh, it's, it's one thing to talk about lights on a bridge, and that means a, a million things to a million different people. And you see many, many examples of ways bridges can be illuminated. It's a little bit of a treacherous terrain for an artist, because I'm coming at this as an artist and not as a lighting designer. Um, but when people saw this, they really got extremely excited, and, and they, they just said, well, how can we help? You know, what can we do to, to realize this piece? The other uh, thing that you know, I realized as, um, as we started exploring how we would do this uh, is that you know, it's one thing to do it in Photoshop, and it's a whole other thing to <laughs> go up there. And uh, you know, the, the Bay Bridge is enormous. Um, it's, uh, this span is, is 1.8 miles long. Um, and uh, the deck is about 250 feet over the water, and the towers are uh, 525 feet over the water. And there really is not a lot up there. Um, it's, it's, it's very minimal, um, but incredibly beautiful. So we went up, and uh, the guys at Caltrans, and, and we started thinking about, you know, what, what would we do? How, how would we do this? Um, you know, is it going to, uh, how do we attach the lights, you know, many, many, many questions about that. But the thing that really was inspirational to me was just the, 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 the visual, the beauty of it, the kinetic activity, the movement of traffic, the atmosphere, the, the shadows, the, the water, all those things were, were um, pretty overwhelming. And, and I felt like, like here, those patterns on the surface of the water, I said, if I can translate, you know, 10% of what I'm seeing, if I can explain this to my programmer, this could be a really magnificent piece. So then we got into the kind of technical plan. Well, how do we do this? Um, and this is a sort of our technical design. Uh, Parsons Sprinkerhoff helped us make this, this piece. Um, you know, these, this is the, the layout of our, you know, we put a huge fiber optic cable along the bridge. These are all the power supplies because the lights I'm using are, they're intelligent. So we needed a network. So the brain of the piece is here in the center tower of the bridge. Um, and, and the control computers are there, and then it's, it, we had to create a huge network and then distribute the data and the power across the entire bridge. So again, it's easier to do it in, in, in computer graphics than uh, you know, actually like you know, getting out there. Um, these, are, these are actually the lights. They're made by Philips, and uh, they're made to at IP66 is the standard. They can be out in wet locations. We had to find a way to fasten them to the bridge. We did a lot of 3D printing of these custom little brackets and um, found a way to attach it to the cables of the bridge, which uh, came back that we were gonna attach it with zip ties, which I was surprised to hear. Um, but that's how, that's how we did it. Um, and here's some of the environment. Uh, this is actually our, some of our engineers um, who are incredible. It's a 200, uh, 480 volt line that's running down here the fiber optic cable that we had to put in that was almost two miles long. Uh, the challenge with the bridge is that there's no access. Uh, there's no uh, pedestrian access. And every time we had to do anything, we had to do lane closures. So we needed police cars, uh, cones, um, and, it, and it was uh, you know, at great expense to do this work. And it all had to happen at night from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. So this could not be done during, um, because you know, this, uh, this bridge is very, it's one of the vital links in the Bay Area. Hundreds of thousands of people use it every single day. So getting everyone out there, uh, we had to hang this basket um, that these very brave contractors would get in and um, go 500 feet over the water um, at night and hanging a very fragile piece of electronics. But it, it was, uh, it required a lot of, uh, you know, just, many, many hours and, and a huge, actually this was the main cost in realizing this project is just the, the, the labor. And of course, testing it, we had to test that all the lights were working um, with laptops. Here's some of the early 
visual tests that we were, had to see a lot of debugging, and there was no way to hide all this activity from everyone in San Francisco. We had millions of people who could see this thing, and so I had to be comfortable exposing the process, and you know, I couldn't put a curtain over it and sort of do my work and unveil it. Um, so I had to be comfortable with everyone seeing the glitches and errors. Here's our server rack and um, our programmer programming team testing and debugging and um, doing all the things that had to be done. And finally, um, you know, when all that was done, I got to sit out in front of the bridge for months uh, programming it live. So I had a, a laptop and our custom software, all the, custom, all the software that we use is custom written, um, controlling the bridge and, and again, finding these sequence, making these discoveries, capturing, refining. But it had to be done, you know, with the bridge. I couldn't do this back in New York and just send the sequences over to San Francisco. Um, it was all about seeing it and being able to tune it, almost like a musical instrument. It had to be very precise, the brightness level, et cetera. So finally, um, this is after, after a huge you know, process, this is some of the actual footage that, that you know, we, of some of the sequences um, that again are, they're, they're abstract, they're, they're no, you know, it's not literal in any way, although there are things that people described as fish or birds or, or different things. There's definitely plays with oscillation and atmosphere. Um, and, you know, it's, it's interaction with the water. The other, the other exciting thing about the bridge is that there's no one viewpoint to see it from. It's so large and visible from so many places that, you know, it's different every time you look at it. Um, and depending on where you are and the time of day, and there's, there are many, many factors to, you know, what, what makes, the, makes the piece what it is. But it's been a, 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 in March it'll be two years and we had it, we got a permit for two years, so that will be our, our run. Um, and it's always been that we would have to take the piece down after two years so they could do bridge maintenance. They have to paint the cables and do everything they need to do. But we, uh, you know, people have fallen so in love with the, with the Bay Lights in San Francisco that uh, we managed to raise an additional $4 million to reinstall it um, after the maintenance is done. So in a year it will be reinstalled and at that point, um, we're going to gift the piece to the state of California, and they will take ownership of it, and it will become permanent, which is uh, very exciting. And uh, so it's, you know, for me, I was very satisfied with two years for a piece of monumental public art. And Christo was, you know, wrote an amazing letter of support for this piece, and I'm very grateful to, to him for that. Um, and for me, I'm, I'm happy with things that are temporary, but if, you know, it's coming from the public and the people love this piece and they want it, then... Of course, I'm, I'm thrilled to, you know, for it to be there. So that's what's uh, come to pass. And it's been a, um, I think we've, we, we estimated 50 million people would see this piece over two years. Um, it's, uh, had, you know, over half a billion media impressions. The story went from local to national to international. Um, it's resonated in a way that no one, no one ever expected. And I think part of the reason we were successful, we just had a remarkable team of people, our, um, that, that, that helped me to, to realize this. Obviously, this is something that not a single artist can do. You need a team. And, uh, and everyone who participated in this had a real sense of ownership, like they helped to make this happen, this remarkable thing. And they could bring their families to see it and show them what they did. And it's something that everyone can kind of share and it becomes a focal point. Almost, a, I've described this piece many times as a digital campfire. So people gather around it on the Embarcadero and they can't help but talk to the person next to them because it just, it, there's this, Something about it that just elicits joy. So it's uh, creating community and, and you know bonding people together is, is incredibly powerful. You know, and beyond being a, a monumental piece of public art, it's, it's actually you know we we did an economic impact study that was uh, said it would bring an additional hundred million dollars into the San Francisco economy over two years. So it's been exciting to be able to um, you know not just make art, but also do something good for the city and, and, to, and to win people over to doing these sorts of things on multiple levels and figure out how to communicate with different civic entities and everyone that you need to in order to realize work like this. But um, I hope that you all will be able to see the film Impossible Light, which we're going to screen. Um, it's available to download and there's some DVDs if you can't see it today. But it tells the full story. It's a 70 minute documentary. And um, for me, it was important, you know, to, to to make the documentary as a, as a 
sort of a ladder that we could throw to other artists and communities that were interested in doing big pieces like this. Well, how do you do it? How did we do it? And you'll see that it was a pretty crazy process of, you know, driven by passion and made a lot of, um, anyway, you can see it in the film. <laughs> but it looks effortless and monumental now, but it really was, um, you know, it, it nearly didn't happen and could have been killed thousands of times, but um, in the end, here it is. And, uh, yeah. So I think that's about it. I'd be happy to take some questions.